Mary Ellen Laponka is an author and an independent scholar researching the history of Cape Ann from the last ice age to around 1700 AD, which is quite an ambitious project. That sounds great. Uh, she's retired from uh, college instruction and textbook developing. And uh, she has a master's degree in anthropology from Boston University and has done postgraduate work at the University of British Columbia. So she's got a long list of uh, other uh, bio CV credits there, but uh, I think- Get all that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we're looking forward to hearing her tell us about stone structures on Cape Ann. So please go ahead. Great, thank you. I'll share the screen. Okay, so uh, we've seen decades of debate about stone structures and modified boulders and constructed landscapes, as you know. And in Massachusetts, as you know, Indigenous Agency for Above Ground Stone Structures has been officially denied, partly because such sites uh, typically lack artifacts. Even the idea of the sacred use of landscape features by Indigenous people was denied, but that I think is now going to change. On purely empirical grounds, we know that people did interact and have interacted with their environments. And there's a large body of ethnological uh, and historical evidence for the spiritual as well as the practical significance of rocks. Uh, and there are indigenous rocks all over Cape Ann. Let's see if that works. Yes, this is the area I'm talking about. Cape Ann is an island. It's separated from the mainland by a tidal river, which is the Anasquam River but it includes Essex Bay, Essex, and Manchester by the sea. This was prime real estate for people from the early archaic period on. Uh, evidence for occupations comes from archeological surveys and artifact collections and historical accounts, um, which suggest that people have lived here more or less continuously over the past 10,000 years and earlier, but with the exception of Bowbrook up in Ipswich, uh, all the late Paleo-Indian sites are underwater under the bays. This area still has miraculously large expanses of undeveloped and minimally disturbed land with surviving stone structures and landscapes that were modified for cultural purposes by middle maritime archaic people. Uh, that were later augmented by late maritime woodland people living in agricultural settlements, settlements prior to contact. Oops, this is very sensitive. There we are. So the people occupying Cape Ann from around 1300 CE uh, and at the time of contact were Abenaki speaking Penacook from the Merrimack Valley in New Hampshire. Colonists called them the Pawtucket or the Agawam Indians. We don't know what they called themselves, probably the people or the real people or the people here. The Pawtucket built forts and watchtowers along the coast for defense against the Eastern Abnaki enemies, which were called the Tarantines. These were Northern hunter gatherers who annually raided all the coastal farmers to their south for corn especially after 1300, when the advent of the Little Ice Age reduced maize production at higher latitudes. The sites of native forts uh, on the coast have survived, lots of them, because that is where the first colonial armories or powder houses were located. Uh, other changes to the land include preserved corn hills and corn mills, stone fish corrals on streams used by migratory fish, distribution of evergreen groves that reflect the long-term effects of slash and burn agriculture on forestation. They built canals through the salt marsh. They built causeways to the inshore islands. There are stone way markers, wet stones, baking pits, cash pits, quarries, mines, and shell middens. They were there for thousands of years and the evidence is everywhere. But my presentation today uh, focuses on what I'm calling spirit rocks. Um, these are stone structures and modified environments that would have been motivated by Algonquian belief systems. In traditional Algonquian belief systems, as, as you know, some rocks and stones, like trees or animals and plants and weather, 
are imbued with supernatural spirit or spiritual power, Manitou, which makes them sacred or at least animate and worthy of respect. Rocks are also the natural abodes of spirits and spirit-like entities that live on the summits in cracks and crevices. They live in bedrock fissures and in caves. Indigenous people clearly had and have places of ceremonial gathering and sacred land. And in those places in the past and probably today as well, they modified stones and erected groupings of them to facilitate prayers to the spirit world. Algonquians also sought to avoid or propitiate a host of dangerous or mischievous entities likened to elves, giants, tricksters, shapeshifters, monsters, demons, witches, sorcerers, ghosts, walking dead, cannibals, escapees from other people's dreams. After 400 years of forced assimilation, descendants have lost or abandoned those beliefs. And aside from a worship of nature, they distance themselves from the animism of their ancestors. The dangerous and mischievous entities survive as the stock and trade of Disney, Marvel, and anime. But we really can't and shouldn't underestimate or disrespect the power that such beliefs held for the ancient people. Ancient uh, belief systems have guided my process for investigation, and my process has included these steps, not necessarily in that order. For example, stone structures always face certain directions intentionally. The cardinal directions are especially important. Beliefs about the locations and requirements of the many spirits or Manitouak are important, as well as beliefs about the locations of ancestors and homelands. People represented and acted upon their beliefs materially. The Algonquian world has a three-part structure, for example, with an underworld or water world, the earth and a sky world, which need to be kept in balance. The cosmos is represented as concentric rings from homeland to edge of universe, usually around a sacred fire or a sacred tree. And there's the structure of time, repeated spirals in which all times exist together at the same time, and that time is the present. Algonquian daily life in the past took place in a state of magic realism in which anything might not be what it seemed. It might be a spirit entity or the messenger of a Manitou or a relative from the past or the future or one of those dangerous or mischievous things that live in crevices and caves and inhabit dreams and can dry up the spring, upset your canoe, or steal your child lost in the woods. I've written a paper on the subject organized by Stone Structures, but for the purpose of, of this presentation, I've organized the information by location. So I'll be showing you examples of spirit rocks working east to west uh, from Rockport's eastern shore at Flat Point, up the coast and around, uh, down into West Gloucester and ending up at uh, Mount Ann, which is the highest point on Cape Ann, uh, at 50 meters uh, above sea level. Uh, it's as high as it gets in that, in that area at the borders of West Gloucester, Essex, and Manchester. So Flat Point uh, is this place space between three and four on this map. Um, and uh, it, cash pits with late maritime archaic fishing gear have been found in this area. The village was where the Rockport Golf Club is now. And the earliest settlers uh, called the area between five and six Old Garden Beach uh, because of the cornfields they saw growing above it along this brook. Um, and, and anything that a 17th century person called old in America was uh, referring to indigenous settlements. Um, now, during the 19th century, this northern, whole northern coast of Cape Ann was a booming granite industry. So the very first thing to do there is to look for signs of modern quarrying. That's always the first step because so many, so much of this granite was quarried. This is all, uh, all igneous rock. 
Uh, flat point, uh, there's so many other things I could say about that, but I'm moving on. Um, flat point has uh, interesting groupings of stones that, uh, and petroforms, including this possible uh, turtle effigy. And there are also um, possible alignments there that should be investigated. Uh, Algonquins refer to Earth as Turtle Island, as you know, in, in Abnaki, which the people on Cape Ann spoke. Uh, that would be Tolba Menahan, based on the story of creation. And as you've seen in some of the other presentations, turtle symbolism is uh, ubiquitous throughout the Northeast. Um, these appear to be incised and wedged boulders, and one possibly in the process of being broken. Um, there's this, this is the north facing uh, reptilian uh, boulder that resembles others at other sites that have the same stylized uh, presentation with the mouth and snout. These are all uh, north facing snake or turtle heads. And there are several on uh, Cape Ann. On private property near Flat Point on Eden Road, I was shown a triangular stone that may also be a Manitou stone upside down. It's in a garden wall next to a white quartz stone. And on the other side is a perched possible effigy stone on the face of a fish in the shape of a fish or a whale. But it's not clear when or by whom these stones were modified or arranged because they were in somebody's garden. But the site certainly seems to warrant further investigation. Eden Road also has this sky watching seat, which may have served to observe the rotation of the bear constellation. It's a north facing seat. Uh, the, uh, when the handle of the Big Dipper, which, um, which is actually the first of the three hunters and their dog who are chasing the bear. When that is perpendicular and touches the horizon, communication opens up between the earth and the sky world. And when the bear is at its zenith on the meridian in the, among the Northern Algonquian cultures, uh, this marked the time for a special renewal ceremony, the bear ceremony. Uh, and this traditionally included a bear hunt a solemn sacrifice of the bear, the rendering of its fat for oil, a special distributions of its oil and claws and fur, and a feast. So it was an important event to mark for uh, winter. North of, uh, north of Flat Point and Rockport Harbor is Pool Hill. This is on land abutting the Dogtown Woods. Pool Hill has stones associated with water and directionality. Woodland period configurations at the headwaters of streams tend to look toward the southwest. Summer solstice and equinox sight lines typically incorporate water bodies or patches of wetland. And stone structures invoking the water guardian serpent often appear on ridge lines and probably mark the direction of groundwater flows. Pool Hill also has possible U-shaped enclosures. Uh, they need to be uh, checked for sight lines to Venus, which are typically associated with vision quests. Uh, and this is a common configuration of stones used to triangulate uh, sight lines against a false horizon. These occur throughout the Western Hemisphere and these examples actually are Mesoamerican, so the degrees are off for our latitudes. But um, it's, a, it's a very common, again, system for, um, for triangulating. Uh, and I, I won't try to explain that any further because I have a lot to go through and I don't want to get sidetracked. Um, so these are cardinal directions uh, being marked in uh, this medicine wheel circle. Uh, this is in the Pool Hill Woods. Uh, there's an introduction of a black piece of black basalt, which has been carried into the area. It's not native to the area, but has been introduced. It's in the West Quadrant. 
And it's similar, I mean, I compare it to this white quartz stone, which was introduced into a, um, a mound in Nipsichuk in Rhode Island. And the association of colors with quadrants uh, marked by the cardinal directions is a universal feature of medicine wheel circles. And uh, the specific, but the specifics vary. Uh, each, uh, for example, the colors might be different uh, somewhere else, uh, slightly different. Um, in, a, in addition to cardinal direction and color, each quadrant is linked to a season, the plants and animals of that season, a time of life, a state of mind, and certain human qualities. These uh, were shamanic sites where healing ceremonies were performed. Medicine wheels can be any size and they do vary regionally, but they must be very ancient because they are found in Suan uh, cultures, the Iroquoians, Athabascans, and other indigenous peoples, as well as the Algonquians. So it is part of the uh, part of a, a mega culture with huge, huge distribution. Uh, directionality is very important. Uh, uh, standing stones that face each other east and west across water from low parallel rises may very well define the perimeter of a sacred site. Um, petroform boulders that suggest spirit animals were put in particular positions associated with the cardinal direction or with the direction in which a ritual was supposed to proceed. Uh, for example, turtle effigies are often found near the entrance for rituals that take place starting from the east and looking west. Uh, for descendants of late maritime woodland people, uh, that was also a direction of pilgrimage, but early, earlier occupants of Cape Ann looked to ancestral homelands in the north rather than the southwest. The southwest uh, focus is more recent. The cardinal directions also mark uh, this uh, turtle mound in Haskins Park. Um, this is near a colonial tan pit and the trail to the pole, uh, Pool Hill Woods. The inset gives an idea of the scale. The earliest records refer to these as turtle mounds and I, I haven't seen anything that looks quite like them. Um, some rocks must have been removed and replaced at some time because the record states that they're hollow and that they are not Indian burials and that they do not hide any pirate treasure. However, they don't appear on the earliest maps. Local folklore says that the mounds were made from rocks cleared from the nearby ox pasture, the now overgrown. I thought it was a lot of trouble for a farmer to go to to arrange the stones so architecturally. Another story has it that Finnish quarrymen stacked them as extras after construction so that they wouldn't have to haul them all back down the hill. I think that's an ethnic slight and that any builder with that amount of labor intensive overstock would have lost his job. I couldn't identify any quarry marks and uh, it, technology for peering through rocks uh, should be applied here by somebody, maybe OSL or the other one, the alternative one, or the, uh, the one for radiation. I think that would be a, a worthwhile project because there is no, no local information on this other than what I've, what I've said. I, I tried a little bit of lichenometry with it. Um, there were rhizocarpon thalli or lichen blooms that span rock to rock. Uh, there were thalli uh, growing uh, over older thalli and there were thalli on uh, cut surfaces uh, as well as original surfaces. Some of the growths were over 50 millimeters in diameter and based on the known rate of growth of these lichen and taking into account factors that affect their growth. I think most of these rocks were in contact with each other and exposed to the air above ground before the colonial period, 500 to maybe a thousand years ago or more. 
However, I am not especially trained in lichenometry, and so that study needs to be done by somebody who is. Continuing up the coast, we come to Andrew Woods, which was saved from redevelopment through local initiative. It has some undisturbed rock features, and the area all along the coast here has uh, pegmatite with outcrops of blue quartz. This was mined by indigenous people here. Andrews Woods has this corn mill, which was ground down in the center. And uh, what I believe is a, a possible burial mound, which appears to be undisturbed. Um, uh, also has uh, a stone circle. It's a stone circle buried in the leaves here. And what was identified to me by an indigenous person as a thunderbird nest um, with an offering plate niche. And according to early colonial accounts, uh, the indigenous people would build brush nests on top of uh, tripods of large boulders uh, to create uh, symbolic housing for the Thunderbird. And they would leave offerings underneath to symbolically feed the Thunderbird spirit. Thunderbirds were potentially both harmful and helpful to people. Uh, like most of the spirits. Offerings of tobacco or sweet grass were placed in bark containers, miniature baskets, or votive vessels made of clay. During the contact period, offerings were made in colonists' discarded glass medicine bottles. These little clay vessels here, uh, votive vessels, were dug up in a garden in Anasquam. And these uh, miniature baskets are from uh, a private collection of indigenous items made for the tourist trade. Little baskets of food were preferred by the Pakwaji in Abenaki. That's the little people in Abenaki. <laughs> I think many different groups had little people um, who were sort of mischievous elves and you needed to stay on the good side of them and they could be very helpful to you, but they lived in rocks among the roots of trees in particular. This is a singleton petroform boulder in Andrews Woods. It's about five feet tall. It clearly has a backbone with pecked vertebrae. The front of the stone was also shaped by human hand and there are flat or tabular stones all around it and leading up to it. I don't know what animal is being represented or what, if any, relationship it bears to the nearby wall. Another feature in Pitchin Cove is this stone chamber called Rose Tomb. These granite blocks were not quarried uh, by modern methods and judging by the diameter of the thalli, they also predate the contact period. Major John Rowe fought in the Revolutionary War and died in New York and was buried there. This is his tomb. Um, local legend has always held that his body was dug up and brought home and secretly reinterred in Rockport, hence this memorial headstone in a Rockport cemetery. Rose tomb, by one account, uh, had bones in it at one time, but those were not the bones of the majors. It was most likely a late maritime woodland family ossuary, and there are many other constructions just like it throughout New England, like this one in Connecticut. Moving down the coast to Lanesville, uh, there are these rocks in Lanes Cove may have other inscriptions on them than the ones I saw, found. Um, these rocks are submerged at high tide and are being overtaken by this bladder rack seaweed. Indians carved on these rocks, according to local legend, and divers have claimed that there are inscribed flat sloping rocks in this area here and just offshore. Uh, those claims have never been substantiated, which might make a very nice project for a dive team. Um, show you what I saw. This is what I saw. And uh, 
I believe they're petroglyphs that indigenous people pecked into this uh, rock in Lane's Cove. The shapes resemble Algonquian symbology for camps or villages, as well as inscriptions on Manana Island in Mohegan, Maine and other places. Mary Gage and James Gage have written about the inscriptions at Manana and other sites. Uh, maybe would uh, have be able to find and examine the Lane's Cove petroglyphs as well. Down the coast from Lanesville is Anasquam, Lobster Cove and Anasquam Heights. Several concentrations of artifacts and human skeletal remains from a large burial ground were taken from this area in the early 20th century. This is the settlement uh, at the top of uh, uh, Lobster Cove and along Leonard Street. Leonard Street has this uh, collection of uh, boulders, uh, includes an intentionally split boulder with petroglyphs. Uh, and it has the characteristic triangular undercutting that you often see in uh, jumbles of boulders of this kind. It seems to be a recurring element. Uh, it doesn't quite look like this now. Some boulders were removed to make a path. This boulder is no longer here. There's a path here now. And uh, for some reason, for unknown reasons, somebody fills in these petroglyphs with some kind of compound. Co compound uh, which gradually, uh, you know, it, it melts from rain and then uh, is reapplied. So I have no idea what that is about, uh, except that one person in Anasquam told me they were afraid that if they acknowledged indigenous presence there, they would have to give back the land and they would end up with a casino. So there's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, funny ideas about these things. Uh, Anasquam has this natural plutonic outcrop, which is called uh, Squam Hill. It would have been used by indigenous people and it would have been very compelling as a ceremonial gathering place. It offers a sight line to the bar where the Tarantine raiders from the north uh, would have paddled into the Anasquam River to raid the Pawtucket cornfields. The sight line now points to the Anasquam Lighthouse uh, at a place called Wigwam Point. There's a snakehead effigy at the top pointing north, which is the direction of attack. And uh, well, just south of Anasquam is Goose Cove uh, the, and the Goose Cove Reservoir. The reservoir, of course, is, is recent. Uh, this is uh, has area has a waterfall, which was once quite torrential and was at some point uh, made uh, directed under the road. Uh, this is the waterfall today, but it still has signs of, uh, you know, pr protection, uh, stonework that protects the source of the spring and uh, provides access for collecting the water. Across the street from it is this whetstone and the V-shaped grooves in it uh, indicate that it was used to sharpen stone tools. The Natty Woodland is just inland from Goose Cove and it has this uh, discontinuous wall with a uh, possible a snakehead effigy and uh, standing stones nearby. Uh, it, the wall is on a ridge line, and it's called Anne's Path after a woman who was murdered near there. Uh, the Natty Woodland also has this panther or mountain lion or lynx petroform. Um, and this same form or similar form is found just like at the, uh, I think another presentation referred to it as a cat, but in uh, Algonquian, uh, mythology or symbology it is a, uh, a panther or it, in among the Abenaki, it's the water lakes, but it's that mountain lion or cougar or whatever. Um, very significant throughout the Western hemisphere as a symbolic figure included, for example, in Mesoamerican and South American uh, religion. 
or spirituality. Notice that the bent tree that's over it, uh, a lot of these are found with a, a tree bent that are, and I believe this is to tether the, the uh, panther spirit to the water world, to its water world um, as a, a way of protecting or, or containing it. Other, other ones that have, are on uh, Cape Ann have the same thing, have a similar feature. And the Anasquam woods above the Natty Woodland contains many types of stone structures, including another serpentine wall. Mary Gage and James Gage have done a lot of work in the Anasquam woods and they have a lot of great pictures. I hope they will share with you at, at some point. Dogtown is the entire center of the Cape Ann Peninsula and Dogtown Common was a colonial settlement that lasted from 1788 to 1840. The colonial cellar holes like this one have been dug for artifacts for about 200 years now. Uh, and there's still, there's still things there. Um, but there are also indigenous landscape features in Dogtown. Some of them were identified in a professional archaeological survey conducted in 2018 by the Public Archaeology Lab. But as in all the CRM studies these days, we are not allowed to know where anything is. These are two types of perched boulders in Dogtown. The grouping of three on bedrock have also been described by others. From time to time, these boulders are found knocked off of their pedestals and at other times restored to them. They're only about a meter square and would not be difficult to, too difficult to move. These rocks propping them up are not part of bedrock. Um, and so, um, and, they're, and the bedrock that they're on has been scoured smooth by the glacier and has no sign of, uh, post-glacial frost heaving. Um, so, but you know, so their constructions, but their meaning and their uh, use remain enigmatic. The same can be said for the propped uh, boulder on the, this, on the right here. These huge monolithic tilted boulders um, were used culturally and modified, but they may originally have occurred naturally. Um, that's not to say that people weren't capable of tilting them. It's just that Cape Ann has Avalonian geology with glacial erratic sometimes resting on frost heaved bedrock. Uh, there's also a differential erosion of foliated bedrock under an erratic, which makes it look like it's been propped up. Uh, however, most of the bedrock on Cape Ann is not foliated. And in any case, some of the rocks under here are uh, not bedrock. They are not frost heaved uh, or otherwise. They were introduced. People brought them there, especially, for example, this white triangular shaped stone with high quartz content that's been placed in there. Some of the other ones have been placed in there too. We can only speculate about the reason. It would have had to do with marking direction, making an astronomical observation, communicating with a spirit or spiritual entity, representing a cosmological concept, or symbolically protecting people in some way. There are other perched boulders that are tilted at this exact same angle in other places in and around Cape Ann. It would be a very interesting study to find out if they all tilt at around 77 degrees to the southeast, because in this area, that is the angle of glacial retreat that would have, might have been responsible for tipping up these rocks, these huge boulders. This is a split boulder in Dogtown, partly filled with what may be prayer stones or honor stones. Um, they could also be blocking a portal to the underworld. Curtis Hoffman pointed out that stones filling cracks may also be meant to block undesirable portals to the underworld. Uh, the little girls, uh, two little girls are my daughter and her friend. My daughter is now turning 50, don't ask. Uh, all right. 
Dogtown has rock piles uh, that uh, may be directional way markers, and there are many walls uh, distinguishing indigenous walls from colonial ones is an art and a science, complicated by the fact that the colonists often integrated indigenous walls in their pasture walls or took stones from indigenous constructions to use in their house and barn foundations and their property lines. We know that indigenous walls do not fully enclose spaces and they often feature niches and intentional openings or vents. An indigenous uh, source explained to me that intentional e events in walls may be communicating respect for the wind spirit that blows across that direction so as not to block its passage. Openings may also be niches for offerings to spirits and of course they may be also natural or accidental. Pole Hill is, uh, has a freshwater wetland uh, on a terrace between two tidal rivers, including the Anasquam River. In 2015, I discovered it as an astronomical observatory and later realized it was probably also a ceremonial gathering place. It's adjacent to a village site recorded as Wenasquam, corrected to Wanasquam. The whole peninsula and river islands are covered with uh, shell middens. Rocks on Pole Hill include a partially perched boulder, a boulder with an intentionally widened crack, and an intentionally wedged bedrock. Um, Algonquians had a tradition of splitting rocks. They often worked from natural fissures and then would either fill the cracks or keep them open. Um, in the crack and bedrock, you can see if you look down smaller wedges uh, that have fallen in as the crack, crack widened and the erosion on the edges testified to its antiquity. The serpentine shape also would have had cultural significance. The serpents were a very significant Algonquian belief as spiritual agencies associated with the water world. They were protectors of springs and waterfalls and they could convey messages between worlds. Algonquian cosmology tended to be non-binary regarding good and evil. Most spirits were capable of both. And so acts of respect towards spirits, offering them prayers or gifts symbolically feeding and housing them and perfectly conducting rituals uh, were in hopes of staying on their good side. This uh, snake or turtle uh, head petroform on Pole Hill uh, rests on bedrock and points true north like the others. It has the same stylized reptile mouth and hooded eye Snake forms usually have a more pointed snout. Pole Hill also has this stone wall about three meters in length with a cut, cut triangular stone in the center. There's also this uh, five foot Manitou stone, which is uh, leaning against the rock it was pecked out of. Manitou stones come in all different uh, styles and sizes. These are standing stones on Pole Hill. This one was described to me by an indigenous source as a possible bison uh, effigy. Wood bison were very common in New England through to the uh, early woodland period. Um, the wood bison were smaller and more solitary than the plains bison, but apparently they were here. These are the rocks that were in the that are in the solar alignments on Pole Hill. This is uh, winter solstice sunset, for example. And this is the winter solstice sunrise to uh, the two, two stacked uh, boulders. Ken Leonard came to uh, Pole Hill and identified several uh, features. Uh, including a sky watcher seat. The rock behind him has these inscriptions, uh, which geologists uh, confirmed were made by people. Uh, he also identified this stone circle and pointed out this broken uh, boulder. 
which was very recent. This, uh, the practice of breaking things like ceremonial blades and weapons and boulders had cultural significance. The meaning had to do with some kind of ending, the end of a life, the end of an alliance, the end of a war, the end of an occupation, perhaps the, the Pawtucket who were the last to use Pole Hill were forced to abandon their village for the last time in 1686 and maybe they broke this rock to sever their ties to the spirits of this place. This is a, a sight line for the uh, uh, equinox, uh, the uh, summer solstice sunset alignment across a wetland. Aerial photography revealed uh, various low walls and stone circles. Other people have uh, explored this site, including Mark Carlotto. I think uh, indigenous people probably did mark out constellations on the ground. However, we don't know what those constellations were and which stars they included in them and which of their mythological figures they were referring to. Um, so I, I think that we shouldn't assume that they used uh, Orion on the ground or uh, any particular uh, uh, constellation, we can only assume that they would have include the, included the planets and the brightest stars in their, uh, in their constellations. And otherwise, we don't know what they were. This is the equinox sight line. And this is the, I call the eye wall because from below, from a distance, they looked like eyes. And then a telescopic photography indicated that they had in fact been pecked into high relief and incised, again, for unknown reasons. These are uh, a whale, this is a whale petroform and it has a blowhole, bird petroform with an eye pecked. Here's the, uh, what someone has called the cat. This is the cougar or water lynx petroform. Again, this uh, tree is growing out of a very ancient uh, uh, tree stump. Um, the back of it suggests that it may have once, have once have stood upright as a monolith. It has a cavity under it, and at the roof of the cavity is this ins inscription, uh, but it needs to be studied. To, maybe it's a mineral stain. Uh, Tim Fole came to the site. He pointed out this uh, triangle, which is a symbol of healing and Algonquian iconography. He also pointed out the horned serpent, which is a common uh, figure. These were also very stylized with the tail anchoring uh, the serpent to the water world where it came from, thereby keeping it safe. Uh, and they all always have one uh, horn more prominent than the other. And usually there is some natural feature in the rock which is used to complete the figure. These, these recur in various places. This uh, serpentine uh, quartz was pecked into high relief and mined. Uh, those uh, bits would have been used either for, to make projectile points or to polish as manuports. Pole Hill also has these uh, pecked uh, basins and drains or things that appear to be pecked. And um, I found a couple of buckets at the, both the north and the south uh, entrance to Pole Hill. Crossing into uh, West Gloucester, we come to Ravenswood Park with petroglyphs, Dykes Pond, Lily Pond, and Haskell Pond on Little River have stone features that should be investigated. This is a rock shelter on Thompson Mountain. Shaman uh, would have come here to collect medicinal plants. There's a sassafras grove and a lot of mushrooms up there. Um, they would have practiced sorcery there. Men uh, wanting to become elite warriors might have taken hallucinogens there and uh, exposed themselves to the elements. Red Rocks Conservation Area and uh, Mount Anne, these are, these are uh, places that would have been uh, certainly not constructed by people. They would have been very culturally significant to the people who live there and they would have used these places. There's a rocking boulder 
and at the red in the Red Rocks area. These were used as lithophones to make sounds. You pound the rock onto the bedrock, makes a booming sound. There's a local legend that says that the elders used to make sounds with that stone to scare the young people uh, undergoing uh, initiation in puberty, their puberty initiation, or to uh, be the voice of a spirit for young people on their first uh, vision quest. Uh, there's also evidence of percussion on the sides. Any long cylindrical stone uh, that's suspended or semi-suspended um, will be a rock gong. And uh, this is a whole science. Uh, apparently it's a universal cultural uh, feature uh, to have rocks making sounds culturally. <laughs> this is Heap of Rocks Hill uh, and all of the dark areas in this picture are rock piles. This, uh, this is a very good uh, site for uh, a LIDAR study. Those have never been documented or you know, figured out. Manchester Essex uh, Woods and Conservation Trust. This was a village right near Agassiz Rock, Cedar Swamp. This rock is uh, called Monster Rock by the trustees of reservation or the trustee, uh, trustees of uh, the Manchester Essex Trust. And they invite families to decorate this rock every year. They weren't too happy when I suggested that this was a, uh, an indigenous uh, spiritual rock. And here's Agassiz Rock. Again, it's irrelevant uh, whether or not uh, people actually tilted the rock themselves. What's significant is that they modified these things and they added to them and they interacted with them. So we need to sort of broaden our sta standards of proof here uh, from an anthropological perspective regarding um, built, you know, stone landscapes. Um, I'm now sort of sort of trying to rush through here, but uh, um, so you know, <laughs> uh, it's people's interactions with their environments that matter, and we may never know what meanings the people gave to them. But we're we're talking about people, and archaeology is not just a material science. So we we need to be more inclusive of other kinds of evidence information from other fields of study, other sciences, and we need to be sensitive to other ways of knowing. Uh, there's nobody to speak for Cape Ann or for the Pawtucket today. Um, there's no one to act to preserve their uh, spirit stones. Um, the, de the descendants assimilated into other groups uh, beginning in 1636 when the Mass Bay Colony made powwows illegal. The nearest recognized groups are not terribly interested. Those are just the, the Massachusetts and the Nipmuc to the South and West. The nearest most closely related self-identifying communities, uh, the Penacook and the Abnaki people to the North, they have no stake in Cape Ann. The state of Massachusetts is not particularly interested so far and indigenous umbrella groups are not inclusive. For example, the stated purpose of USET is to preserve the sites of federally recognized tribes. Patrilineal bands with no surviving intentional communities don't, don't qualify. And if it were not for the philanthropic land trusts, such as the Essex County Greenbelt Association and the trustees of reservations, and the rise of recent human rights uh, and social justice commissions in the towns, uh, Cape Ann Spirit Rocks would already be lost to commercial development. Uh, the trustees asked me to suggest alternative names for Agassiz Rock uh, because of the because of uh, Lewis Agassiz's objectionable beliefs about scientific racism. Uh, but let's hope that the efforts of these commissions go beyond rena renaming places for individuals with objectionable beliefs, because now more than ever we need to do more to preserve spirit rocks than can be achieved by a cancel culture. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Mary Ellen.